I'd like to begin by thanking our very illustrious panelists for joining us today. It's been a very challenging year, difficult on so many levels. But we would like to see the Binyan Bayashlishi and every Jewish home together collectively is a conglomerate of the ultimate home, the Third Temple. And if there's friction in the home, if there's dissension between children and parents, teenagers bickering and fighting with mom and dad, tati, mommy, abba, and ima, how will we see the rebuilding of the Third Base of Migdosh? And therefore, today we have with us panelists who will present answers, aids guidance. BJX has a helpline. It's a resource for you. It's a complimentary helpline. If you have a question, if you have a dilemma, if you have someone that's off the derrick, please reach out to us. The phone number is 646-397-1544. We are there to help you, to assist you, to enable you on your journey, a colleague, a child, 646-397-1544. So someone approaches you, a new, newly married couple, and they say to you that they're frightened to have children because all of their siblings are off the derech, all of their nieces and nephews are off the derech. What, Rabbi Finger, let's please begin with you. What three practical tips could you provide this newly married couple with to ensure that they will, Bez Hashem, have healthy, sane, successful Yiddish children? Well, it's very interesting because I think it was Chizki Oa that was afraid to have children. Um, and, uh, you know, he was told by the Navi Yeshaya that don't second guess God. That's Rabbi Shalom's plans. He says, give me a daughter then. <laughs> Marry a daughter. Um, I think that uh, the, the critical, critical component is a house that's a loving house, where the spouses love one another. The, the greatest thing that a couple could do for their children is to have a, a beautiful relationship and work on their relationship. Work on it. Boina by his number Israel. Boina means constantly building. You don't get married and then say, well, uh, you know, we worked on it, Shana Rishona. No, no. It's constantly, perpetually building, building, building. You have to have a, uh, it has to become a trio. You, your spouse, and, you know, you know to bring in a rav. You got to have a das Torah. You have to have a mentor in your lives who you turn to. And that avoids a lot of strife, a lot of bickering between couples. You know, we, we have a fight. Let's just turn to the rabbi. Here's the rabbi. What's, what does he say? But a loving house is very, very, very important. Learning how to love learning the communication, the language of love, there's different languages of love, learning how to key into someone's emotions, someone's sensitivities. That, I think that's, that's very, very important to create a wholesome, happy, healthy home. Rabbi Grossberg? So, I mean, I think, I just keep thinking about the first, the first car that I bought on a coil budget was, um, did not make it very far. The second and third were not overly successful as well. Rather than saying, I'll never drive again or I'll never buy a car again, I say, no, something, I'm going to start doing some research and figuring out what is the best way to buy a car that I can afford that will get me where I need to go. And with that research, consumer reports, whatever, I, Baruch Hashem, was relatively matzliach with car number four. But the point is that, you know, it, yes, it, you, you're bound to make the same mistakes everyone else is making unless you do something different than they're doing. So it's, you know, Baruch Hashem, you can also look at so many people that are matzliach, the point is that just because others are not Matzliach, and it's unfortunate, but it doesn't mean that you know, one should not lose their own self-confidence and their abilities. Rabbi McCann? Right. I agree with uh, what you were saying, Rabbi Finger. The number one thing I would tell this couple is that they have a good marriage. First of all, for themselves, Shalom Bayis, you know, Lishma. And then there's Shalom Lishma that you mentioned that for the kids. The kids who grow up in a, in a, in a happy, healthy home, They'll be able to weather the storm. Number two, so that's the first thing, is the marriage. Number two is I spoke about the Shabbos table, very important. I might as well throw in over here something I like, always like to say. You know, there's a min hug that many people do, and some don't, of giving brachas out to your children at the Shabbos table. So I take it upon my neshama right now for those people who do, don't have that minig start, and if there's something wrong with it, I take it on my neshama. Every father, that's a time. First of all, you can finally get near your 18-year-old son and give him a hug and a kiss. You can't do that too often, you know. And you got to give your children, and, you, and not just quick. You, you give them the bracha, and then you say something nice in the air. You whisper, you look beautiful. You something nice. And then the chiddush, I think, is why can't the mothers give a bracha too? 
Every mother should be giving a bracha just like the father does to all her children. I think that's very important. And number three, I mean, that, that is so powerful. I mean, I've been saying this for years. I have literally hundreds of letters and emails in my office, hundreds, how that, th- th- those few moments where they're lining up over there and the father's giving a bracha and then the mother gives a bracha, and have, I, I, I give my, my sons-in-law get a hug and a kiss and a, and a bracha. My wife does for my daughter's law. child, what do they have coming up this week that they need a bracha for? Yeah, oh, beautiful, day, you know, beautiful. I, it might be oh, finals or a basketball and when, game. And when it's right. Right. Is that what you do when you're home? Do you yeah. do that? Do that. Beautiful. Beautiful. That's beautiful. beautiful. And one I, more I, thing. Now 40,000 people know it. I read a memoir yeah. from a Holocaust survivor. She said that what kept her through the atrocities of the Holocaust was her father's breath on her when he gave her the bracha. Wow. It lingered. It lingered on her. Third thing is, is, is the, like we've been talking about, the chinuch that we give to our children. You know, the Sefer HaChinuch, was written uh, no, a thousand years ago, before cell phones and before internet, before everything. And the, in mitzvah kuf yud zayin, it's a mitzvah not to pour honey on the mizbeach. So the chinuch always used to give reasons for the mitzvahs, right? That was what the sefer was written. And he writes over here, I can't find any reason. I can't really find the shayrish and the reason why Hashem does not want us to pour honey on the mizbeach. But then he writes, however, we must do everything we can to explain to our children. He says two words, the ta'amim v'so'alos. The reasons for the mitzvah and the benefit. In other words, your son's about to be bar mitzvah. Tzadik, here's why Hashem wants us to put on tefillin. Number two, here's why it's good for you. My daughter, here's why Hashem wants us to dress sneistic. Here are the reasons. Number two, here's what you gain from it. The benefit is so alos. And then he writes, if we don't do that, he writes, uh, they're going to kick away Yiddishkeit and go off the derech. Uh, the, 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 they're going to kick away Yiddishkeit. A thousand years ago, if we don't tell them the ta'amim and the sa'alos. That's meaning, why he was meaning, anonymous. Right, that's why he was anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> meaning you got to be salesmen. Everything is, yeah, we're in sales, we're in sales. Maybe it wasn't like that a hundred years ago. You saw the Chavetz Chaim in the street, or you saw the Chazanish. You, we're in sales. This is it, and this is what we do in Fartik. Not today. We're in sales, and we have to, this has to be our mahalach. And that's what I would tell this young couple. <laughs> okay, thank you, Rabbi. Dr. Torsky. Uh, with the exception of hanging a sign on your door that identifies the name of the family, you have to have an imaginary sign on the door that says you're, you're about to enter a Beis HaMikdash. And every Jewish home has to be a microcosm of a Beis HaMikdash. You know, learning typically goes on in a Beis HaMikdash. There's all this farm over there. Historically, there was no chos in shas in, uh, before World War II. People didn't get a shas when they got married. The shasin were in the shul, and people did not have svarim on them, except for the uh, t- tended to have a, a library. Otherwise, he had a chumash, a sitter, a telem, maybe one or two other things. But otherwise, the svarim, the svarim dealers had a very, very limited uh, base of customers. Um, Learning typically went on outside the home. The answer to that is not any longer. Learn in the base manager. Whatever you were doing there, keep doing there. But add to it some time that you're making your home a place where you learn. When, wherever you learn, Pirkei says, no matter whether it's 10 people, 5 people, 2 people, or 1, there's hashos hashchina there. I want the shechina in my home. And now, I have to, that means that I have to make the environment not something which rejects hashos hashchina. So I have to have a home that has kedusha in it. Now that's Torah, avoda, daven and shul, daven with a minion. What happens if somebody has to stay at home? We just had this last year with being quarantined, right? Uh, women very often don't go to shul to daven. Designate the location in the home. This is the davening corner. When you daven, you stand there. Why? Kaveya makam litfila say true, but I'm designating that a part of my home is a makam tefila. Tzaka, I'm sure that there's plenty coming to your door. I'm sure that there's plenty of mail coming into your, your mailbox. And we have to build the amudim of taira avayda gemilz chayasadim to be constant in our home. When you have a home like that, and, and you cherish it, it's not, oh, fooey, there's another schnarr at the door. You know, you don't look at it that way. Oh, there's somebody collecting for this or that, right? Take, we, we make our home a place 
where we beautify mitzvahs, where we enjoy them, where it becomes something that, that, that we can be involved with passionately, where we're emotionally involved in it. The famous story of the, from the Chavetz Chaim, where there was a, a Talmud who lit up a cigarette when he was learning Shabbos afternoon. And when they brought this Talmud to the Chavetz Chaim, he didn't rebuke it because there was no point in that. The guy knew that he's not supposed to smoke Shabbos. He wasn't silly, he was learning there, right? Chavetz Chaim just sat there and just repeated Shabbos, Shabbos Kaidish, and he cried. He conveyed the message that of, of, the, of the emotion that goes with it. That had the greatest impact. So the, the, this is, if we do this with our homes, our children grow up with, with the kind of feelings that this is something positive. Then they're not, then they're not gonna be attracted. Nobody has to escape from this. You have to beat the competition out there. So there are multiple paths the multiple reasons why people go off the derech. And some people may attribute it to one factor, to one reason. Would you agree, perhaps you could, is there one underlying reason why people go off the derech? Is there one overwhelming reason that you could perhaps isolate and identify why people are going off the derech? Well, two minutes to answer this question, please. Okay. Well, the, while there are multiple factors, and, and there, there are people who talk about certain ones, certain of these um, specific ones being the main one, I don't know what the numbers are. But I would say that personal rejection, which, can, which is a very, very broad term, and it would include in it humiliation, it would include in it bullying, it would, it would include in it being, being, um, being, being punished either severely or unnecessarily. It would include the entire spectrum of kinds of abuse, many that we like to talk about, many that we don't like to talk about. And, and, and this is regardless of where the environment is that, that these things are taking place. And the way in which this works is that children see these things happening to them and they fault the authority figures. And not necessarily the specific authority figure who's the perpetrator, but rather they lump all authority figures and they put them all into the same pot. So that somebody who may have been mishandled or abused or whatever or rejected at, at home is likely to see a, the, the school faculty as adults, as authority and power figures in their lives in exactly the same light, and they will generalize. And the younger the children are, the more likely they are to be doing that. And if, if, you, if you expand it to, to, to talking about rejection, you're probably talking about, a, about close to 100% of all the kids. They are not being tempted by other things. They are running away from this. What's the predominant reason that people, you would say, in your experience, are going off the derech? First, we have to define what off the derech means, but that's a separate discussion. But um, there, there are, you know, there are so many reasons. It, uh, it could be trauma. It could be an unhealthy home. It could be school. It could be a, you know, a, a diagnosed learning disability, and therefore they don't do well in school, and therefore they have low self-esteem. And then there, you can have kids who come from the most wonderful homes, parents did everything right, and there's a problem. And then they come from homes that are like, they're not so healthy, and they produce wonderful children. So I'm but I would say two things, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Two very, what I would consider, the, one is the homes. The homes, the, the unhealthy atmosphere that exists in so many homes, and there's so much to say about this. And two is technology, the technology. Technology today, we could talk about this for hours, um, it's both a catalyst, it is a cause for kids rebelling, but, and it's, it's also a symptom. It's, it, it, you know, it, but te the technology is so destructive. Our kids today are facing a Yetzirah that has nuclear weapons. I grew up in the 60s, the Yetzirah had bullets. Once a year, a hand grenade. Once a year. Today, it's 24-7 nuclear weapons. And if we don't protect them, if we don't prepare them for this nuclear war out there, we're, we're in serious trouble. Rabbi Grossberg, is there a predominant reason, is there a common denominator that you see in your experience why children and teenagers are going off the derech? So this is a question that is, I guess, or get asked often because a lot of people feel, if I know what the cause is, I'll just stay away from that and I'll be okay. But that's not, there, there is no way to do that. You know, there is, it's probably one of the most popular questions if, you know, the, the issue is, 
you know, television, I want to have a television. The issue is a broken home. I'm married. Everything should be okay. But I can tell you in our school, we had from the best homes, from the most dysfunctional homes, we had Aleph students, we had Dalit students, and everything in between. Um, if I had to give one possible thought, and it really goes along the Mahalach of what Rabbi Tversky was saying, that is a lack of self-confidence. Now, a lack of self-confidence has nothing to do with the reality. Meaning that, as I say, we had Aleph students, we had Dalit students. You could have an Aleph student who's top of the class, but because of certain comments that have been made or being treated a certain way, they lack the self-confidence. So it's not about the actual abilities, but it's much more about that lack. Once you lack self-confidence and you don't feel that you're getting the um, motivation, you're, you're getting really the, the recognition from the proper places, that's when you start looking for it in other places. I'll just add one other point, is that we focus a lot on physical abuse, and for, for good reason, it's understood. But I think people don't really understand that emotional abuse can be just as damaging to a child as physical abuse. We, know, we understand when Loyalenu and I'm not has to rating abuse, this one is better, this one's worse, they're all terrible. But we, sometimes we look at, you know, it was physically abused and we understand everything, but this person, okay, so he, he was made fun of, he was at, pushed out of a clique, uh, she didn't go to the right camp. No, it's not the end of the world. It wasn't like they were physically abused, but the truth of the matter is, kids are so tzabrochen from these things. We have to really understand that that emotional abuse can be just as damaging as physical abuse as well. Okay, well, thank you very so you'll forgive me, I'm going to be a little irreverent, and I'm going to recalibrate and refocus your question. You know, everybody wants to know why kids go off the derech. I say, who said they were ever on the derech? I'm not going to say, I'm not going to make an outlandish and audacious statement, say most Jews are not on the derech. But a lot of Jews, a lot of from Yidin, were never on the derech. They're placid, they're spiritual cadavers, they're walking zombies. They have no feeling for Yiddishkeit. They're doing it because if they don't keep the mitzvahs, then their bubby will have a heart attack, or the neighbors will talk about them, or they're afraid that their sibling or they won't get a shidduch. But there's no real gefil. You know, the Kutzker used to say that, uh, it says, v'chai bohem, you should live by the mitzvahs. He used to say, v'chai bohem doesn't mean just live by the mitzvahs. He says, you should be alive. There's got to be a frish kite. There's got to be something that animates you. There's got to be something that makes you feel, I'm in love with the one above. And if you're not in love with the one above, then you'll be in love with something else. Something else will seep into the void. Because you have to fill yourself. You're not an animal. An animal gets satiety. An animal gets fulfillment from mating, from copulating. It gets satiety from working. It gets uh, some kind of fulfillment from eating. All those f recipes, if that's what would make a human being happy, then we're in trouble. We need something else. We need to be in love with the one above. You know, in a country such as America, we're now, we're corroding every single day. We're splintering. Why? There's no more nationalism here. There's no more patriotism. How many people believe in America? What is a Memorial Day? You ever see anybody go to a cemetery and, you know, pay tribute to the fallen soldiers? They're barbecuing. They go on the beach. So if you have a country without nationalism, without patriotism, what about a Judaism that has no real fidelity, that has no real allegiance, where people don't actually feel any type of belonging, where they're going through the motions, mitzvahs and nashim, it's, it's basically just habitual, robotic, and you know what? It's not lasting. So let's talk about how to get people on the derech before we talk about why people went off the derech. They're not going off. They were never on. I'm sorry, I don't mean to, you know, to be a spoiler here, right. but I want to see people on the derech. You know, I, I appreciate that very much. In fact, I could share, we actually have um, half a dozen people, mothers, I know it's always mothers that call us, not the fathers, uh, their sons, uh, FFBs are dating Gaitas, Nebuch. And what can we do to help them? Baruch Hashem, we've helped three, out of the, th three of them so far, Chazay Hashem. The others are in progress, it's a journey. But it's, it's awful, it's terrible. We have a fellow, he may be watching this today. So you're saying that intermarriage is no longer just a uh, secular problem, it's in the firm world. Uh, unfortunately. We have a fellow who may be watching this today. He's in his 50s, and I, I'm not going to say his name, of course, and I, I think he gives me permission to even relate this. He's in his 50s, a from married man, somehow just stopped putting on talis and tefillin. And um, he came to us for chizuk. He started joining the shul and davening. And he'll send my, the Rav or myself a text message. I'm up to day 320, Talos and Tefillin. Unbelievable. But um, yes, people need an injection of Chiyos. And people should feel alive. People should be passionate. Many people put the blame on yeshivas. They say the system is at fault. If you could just please give me a synopsis, a very brief answer. What's your take on that? 
It's a difficult question to answer because it has political ramifications. The reality is that our yeshivas have undergone metamorphosis from, from several decades back to now, and there are things that are going on now that, that nobody would have fathomed were necessary back then, and they are there from the providing of, of services to placing professionals uh, inside the um, schools uh, to training programs for mechanchem and uh, teachers. There's, there's a plethora of, of, um, of things that have, have become chedushim over the last, I don't know, 30, 40 years uh, with major organizations being involved at conventions of Aguda and Tayyarum. So you get to see an array not just supplies and and products that are made for this, but the 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 teaching of skills and not just the skills of how to teach, the skills of how to interact with students. There's precious precious um, progress that has gone on over these last bunch of years. Having said that, there's a whole lot more progress that needs to happen. But we need to take a a second look over there because we're trying to take the, the perspective of kids that are off the derech or at risk or whatever our favorite label is, and we're trying to contrast that with what goes on for the quote-unquote on the derech kids or the, or the quote-unquote normal kids. And the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a dilemma when you, you do that, you're trying to apply a set of rules from one population to the other. What we need to keep in mind is something very, very simple. There are no two people on, on the planet that are absolutely identical. There are no two molecules that are identical, because otherwise you have a very a, a powerful philosophical question, why is this one here and why is that one there? So clearly, each one is there where it needs to be, and each one is unique. And the Chazal tells us, just like their facial appearance is not the same, their, 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 their psychological makeup is not going to be identical. No matter how many children there are in a family, the exact chinuch <coughs> skills that are used for one may be a misfit for the other. Why? Blame it on genetics, blame, blame it on Gilgal, blame it on anything you like. But when you finish the blaming, the reality is that the way you raised your first child may fail at raising your second child, who may be a normal kid, just has different needs. And this is when, when we begin dealing with individual needs and recognizing that we're grouping them, whether we're doing it as parents, whether we're doing it as mechanchem, we're, we're committing a disservice because I need to be doing for that child according to that child's needs. Now, bar the fact that parents have never gotten a license to a parent, right? There are more teachers who have, have become certified and qualified through training. Parents have almost never become qualified through, through having a, a, uh, a training program for it. So here we are doing what we think we know best with the best of, of intentions. But are we matching the chinuch that we're applying to this child to the needs that this child has? That's an excellent point. Uh, Rabbi Mechanic. Is it fear, Rabbi, Dr. Tversky mentioned that there's a paradigm shift recently yes. in the yeshiva systems, Beis Yaakov's. Is uh, it fear, so many kids in Nebuchadnezzar off the derech, is it fear to blame the system? No. First of all, the system comprises the, yeshi the home, the yeshiva, the camp, and the shul. So there's many parts of the system, that's first of all. I want to bring uh, uh, irrefutable proof how the system has changed for the better, as Rabbi Tversky is saying. I, 27 years ago, when I wanted to start this program to take, you know, everything I learned in Kir V'chokim from, from in, in Eishat Torah from Rav Noach Weinberg and package it differently and bring it into the yeshiva system, I took out the Torah Masora day school list. I called up 300 schools. 295 hung up on me. Mm. They said, what do you want to teach? I want to discuss with the kids why they're, gonna, why they're from. Why are they from? Five schools were interested, the very, very left-wing modern orthodox and today we're in 412 schools, 412 schools. What changed? 
What changes? A lot changed. Uh, first of all, the situation out there. Uh, they're beginning to realize um, uh, that they need to talk about this. Um, you know, I want to I just say one thing, I think a very important point. We're all talking about off the derech. Look, this is my experience, you know, 400 schools, 300,000 kids, anywhere you go, 10% of the class, basically, is going to be problems later on in life, okay? 20% are tzaddikim, gemurim, give them cell phones, give them, it doesn't matter, they're kaddish, but you can have no problems with them. It's the 70% that, that, that's up for grabs who probably will remain from their whole life. But like you said, like, the, like Rabbi Fringer said, they don't love Yiddishkeit. And the problem with that is we have nuclear weapons in our cell phones and, and what's going on out there. So what's going to be with their children and the grandchildren? So it's these 70% that's up for grabs that we have to lighten up their neshamas. Okay, so Rabbi Grossberg, what's your modality to lighten up the neshamas? What can, what can we do on a practical level to get the kids back on track, get them excited about Yiddishkeit, and make sure, ensure that there will be future generations that are proud Upstanding Yiddin. So uh, there's a lot of movement, as uh, you know, everyone else has said already, that the yeshivas are definitely open to new ideas. Rabbi Mechanic is teaching Emunah and Bitochen to kids that didn't even know they could, you could have a child who can learn Ramban's Balpeh and Sipurnos or whatever other homework they have, but bring their Banjim into their lives is just not there. I think we have to bring Hashem into the classroom. Now, I'll tell you a story. One time I was um, speaking to a group of uh, from Yaakov girls, 12th graders, and I was talking about the relationship to Hashem, and over two girls saying, I bet he's a Balchuva. Hmm. Like, talking about Hashem must mean that I couldn't be from, you know, the Haredi. Uh, uh, 100%. I hope, to be do- I hope I'm still doing tshuva. But, that, but you know, it's foreign sometimes. We have to bring the Rabbi Shalom in that, you know, that, that there's a, a, maybe some will call it an element of Hasidus, uh, I'm coming from a Katha Litvak, but say it, it, whatever the point is, that we have to bring some of that Hislahavas, we have to bring some of that, it's Kishmak to be a Yid, it's Kishmak, there's a relationship with Hashem. It's not dry, it's not memorization, it's not tests. There's, there's a lot there that, that is there to give, we just have to give it. We have to be, like we said, salesmen. Whether it's a kumzitz, whether it's singing, whether it's, it's hashkafa classes, whether, whether it's going to gedo- whatever it is. I mean, the, the sale is different today when we have nuclear weapons. I'll just point out also, there's a reason why sometimes camps are more matzliach in two months of turning on a, a, a bacher or a, a besal girl, what yeshivas and besachers are not doing in 10 months. Not that they're doing anything wrong. Again, you know, as everyone said, this, there's, a, there's a wonderful system that's constantly improving, but the camp model allows itself for more the, the kumzits and the thinking and the beautiful Shabbos meals and all these other things that, related, that, that are there that perhaps we need to bring as well into the, you know, the, the other 10 months of the year. So, so, so I'm not going to shy away from controversy, so I want to talk about the, you know, the yeshiva system. Is it broken or not? So I find that in our base marriage program, we have base marriage program for mainstream boys, and I find that some of these boys actually have a phobia against Gemara. When they look at a Gemara, they start hyperventilating. <laughs> I'm serious, you know. Why? Why is that? Because when you take a 10-year-old kid, Gemara, and Chas Rishon, not in any way to belittle the Gemara, Gemara is Rosh Tevis, it's an acronym for real, Michal, Rafael, real. You know, it's the most sublime... It's, it's our life force. When you take a 10-year-old kid and subject that kid to what you need, cerebral analytical skills, and you subject a kid to something, you know, it's like teaching a kid calculus before he learned algebra or before he learned basic arithmetic. So, so something, listen, the Perky Elvis doesn't say to teach a 10-year-old kid Gemara, it says 15. So I'm not in any way denigrating, I'm saying, but maybe, maybe that 10-year-old kid Something has to, something, something felt up, as we say in Mama Lushen. Something's lacking. A kid should not have a phobia for something that he should be in love with. You want a kid to be in love with Torah. You want a kid to be in love with Rabash, in love with the one above. Not to have resentment and hostility and not to have post traumatic stress disorder. I'm telling you, I've seen these kids with PTSD over learning. And it's, it's chaval. You know, when I, yeah, when, when I set out to put together these seminars and go in and inspire these kids. I went around to my chaverim, and I'm doing that now with my chaverim here. Why are we from and love Torah and love Yiddishkeit? All five of us. And I believe the answer is because we received what I consider the three amudei hachinuch. Number one, we know that the Torah is emes. That's first of all. It's a Torah emes. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us a Torah. How do we get that? We all have our ways. 
Some it's because, you know, uh, the, the material, let's say, that I teach in the schools. Me? I saw Rabbi Moshe Feinstein many, many times. That, that was the biggest proof of all. You know, Rabbi Shalom Zaman or Rabbi Yisrael. One is we knew there was a Torah Semis. Number two is the five of us know that this is, we have a Torah Chaim, that the most pleasurable, sane, intelligent way to live our lives is to be Afrum Yid. There's a lot to say in this. And three, we recognize that we're part of the Amhan Nifra, the greatest nation ever to exist on this globe. We're Yidin. We love Yidin. We love Klal Yisrael. And if these three Amudim, if you think deeply, that we think deeply, we have those three Amudim in us. And that's why we love Yiddishkeit and love Torah. And we wouldn't dare, you know, go off the derech and, you know, betray Hashem and betray our nation. And this, we have to figure out, how did we get this? when we were growing up in the 60s and the 70s, and how do we give this over to our kids? And we have, we have to figure this out. To the 70% that are up for grabs. So it's, it's very interesting you say that, because a lot of Yidin have a persuasion that's more Catholic than Jewish, and that is about infallibility. The Pope is infallible, because he wears that red yarmulke. <laughs> but to say that every Rebbe is infallible, and then chas v'chalil, if a kid experiences something that's irreconcilable in their brain, and sees hypocrisy, sees inconsistency, then basically, you know, the saying is, you don't judge Judaism by the Jews. And you don't judge Torah by the practitioners of Torah. The Torah is perfect. God Almighty is the Tzor. He is Tomim. He's perfect and unblemished. Say, but is every year like that? No. No. No, no. So we say you don't judge an architect by the people who live in his building. <laughs> <laughs> you understand? The architect right. produced the Chavetz Chaim. Right, yeah. Okay? So, right. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I'd like to share, you know, talking about the, the beauty of Yiddishkeit. So I, I was sitting at a Shalab's table with a bunch of unaffiliated Yidin, and um, a public high school boy says to me, so at the Shabbos table, Friday night, says to me, he says, Rabbi, how many years are you keeping Shabbos? I didn't understand this question. I said, could you please repeat yourself? He said, no, no, I just want to know, how many years are you doing this amazing, awesome thing? I said, I was born into it. I'm doing this my whole life. And he said, wow, he couldn't believe it. But, but to me, the, the most empowering thing is the veracity of the Torah, that it's authentic, it's true, it's true. Rabbi Tversky, do you have something to add to, to what Rabbi Mechanic just shared with us? You know, the, the, one, of the, uh, one of the dynamics that, that I've heard people, when, you know, when, when, when there's somebody who went off as a, a teen, whatever going off means, when, they, when you talk to them about it, one of the things that I hear from them routinely is the people that I was that I was supposed to look up to, I couldn't look up to them. They were not practicing what they preached. So right. here they are telling me you have to this and you have to that, and I didn't see them doing it. You know, the, the, I'm just going to reminisce. Some 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 number of years ago, schools used to get drug prevention money and. One of the schools decided that they were going to use it to bring my father to speak to the kids about substance abuse. Why do you want to put chemicals into your system? And, uh, and they paid his airfare and he gets on a plane, takes a taxi from the airport, the cab pulls up in front of the school and he's supposed to go on in let's say 20 minutes and they had just let the kids out for recess. And the Hanhala, the Manal, and a few of the, of the members of the Hanhala were standing outside the building smoking. Mm. <laughs> and he walked up to them and he said, I cannot speak to them about not smoking or not putting chemicals into their body because you are showing them that it is okay. I'm not going to waste my time. Um, thank you for the free ride, <laughs> the honorarium, t uh, the honorarium check you can keep because I didn't because I didn't I didn't do that that presentation. Thanks for the free ride, and he went dire directly back to the airport. Uh, we have to have, and uh, maybe this is maybe this is pointing to a negative behavior on the part of the people that are supposed to be um, modeling. I, I I demand from a model more than that. I want the model to, to, to portray the beauty of Shemiris Mitzvahs. So that old question, my kid used to daven every day and stopped davening, my 12-year-old, my 8-year-old, whatever. What do we do? It's not about making the 8-year-old kid daven. You can have the kid sitting next to you, you can whack him every, every 10 seconds, look inside, turn the page. You could do that if you like, it's just not going to work. What you do 
is you make tefillah something that you involve yourself in it passionately. When you're talking to your kids at the Shabbos table, it is not like, oh, you know, you really didn't daven go today, or you daven go today, which is not a bad thing to say, but point out, you know what? You looked like you were really connected when you were when when when, when you were singing something or other. Um, you can point out, you know, so and so is sick. Maybe you should daven for them. You're telling them that your tefillahs matter. That's a precious message. Do your children ever see you cry when you daven? Not, not, not just on, not just on Yom Kippur, right? We can be we can be emotionally involved in it. Those things talk to them. Do you understand what you say when you daven? What does it mean? Rabbi Mechanic, is there a community that you're aware of where children are happier and perhaps less at risk? So, probably grow through. Would you like to take that question? <laughs> Maybe there's I think I answered it already when I said that we had from, you know, I, I would look out the, the door sometimes by PTA at our school and it was, I said, this is Kibbutz Goliath. This is, you know, this is what the Rabbi Shalom, unfortunately, it, it's sad that it takes a tzara, and unfortunately the other tzara that also bring everyone together, but we had from, you know, Chassidish Levush to, to Kippas Rugal, all in one room, all dealing with the same issue. Okay, so Rabbi Dr. Torsky, you're originally from Milwaukee. Would you say there's an out-of-town community that's more conducive for children and teenagers to grow up where they're happier and less at risk? I wish I, I wish I knew the answer. I'm not sure that there is one on planet Earth. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there aren't any on Mars yet. Um, the, 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 the factors are, are, are just so many that go into the, 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 the child development vis-a-vis -vis having a religious uh, and spiritual life that there are so many factors that can, that can um, interfere. And I don't know why that should be limited to any geographic location. I'd like to ask with Robbie Dr. Torsky, if you could please tell us, in 20 seconds or less, and we'll go to the rest of the panelists, true or false? True or false, a Rebbe has the greatest impact on a child's development in Yiddishkeit. I believe that that's not the case. I believe that, the, that there's far more impact that goes on within the home. Everybody has tremendous impact, and the community at large has impact, and the love of the shul where the family davens has impact. The volume of time that goes into living at home is critical. The parents serve primarily as role models. The adults of the home have that very, very special role. And there's much more exposure to that, not just sh um, Shabbos, but every day and every night. If a home involves dysfunction, it involves a missing parent, if, if, there's, if, there's, if there's somebody there with, with mental illness, if there's another child in the family that's draining the attention of the parents because of whatever, whatever the issues might be, those, those are homes that have that, that, that have uh, um, detractions from being able to have the time to transmit values through modeling. Okay, so I'm going to return with a follow-up question. Thank you, Rabbi Dr. Tversky. Uh, Rabbi Mechanic, in 20 seconds or less, is that true or false? I agree completely with what Rabbi Tversky said. False? Yeah, it is, it is mainly the home, without a doubt. Mainly the home. Yeah, definitely. You know, we, we, we all have a physical skeleton that holds our organs together. We also have what's called an emotional skeleton, and that is formed and strengthened in the home. And if someone, if a child or a teenager, if they're emotionally healthy, they come from a healthy home, they can weather the, the, this Yetzirah that we have today that has nuclear weapons. So everyone needs to realize that, you know, obviously the Rebbe plays an important role and the, f the family plays an important role, but at the same time, every one of us, as ambassadors, we put on the yarmulke, we dress a certain way, we act a certain way, we're being watched. And for whatever reason, you know, that's for a different conversation, kids are definitely looking at it with a much more critical eye than perhaps in the past that they did, not accepting things at face value that they did in the past. So it's really important for all of us to realize we all have that effect on uh, the teens of today.
he gave us a piece of our life back. Uh, what, what can we add? We are a Brooklyn family. Our son came from a, a regular right-wing background, and then he went through the regular system. He graduated uh, from, a, from a regular yeshiva. The breaking point was he dropped out of, out, out of any measure of, of, of observance. He lost it all. You're missing a child. You're missing a child. <laughs> the practices that were being practiced in BGX davenings and other kind of gatherings and breakfasts and speakers, he came in and they saw him and they, they understood what his needs were. <laughs> they gave it to him. Started walking, it's a, you know, a 45 minute walk from his home, started walking for Friday nights. And it's a direct result of his experience with BGX. They helped him, they encouraged him, they even sponsored his start of yeshiva in So Not when he went after high school, but he went back again as a result of, Years later, he went to our Sameach, and that was all BGX is working. It's getting your child back. It's getting, a, it's getting a piece of your life back, you know. Our feelings of appreciation are, are, are beyond. He went to Yeshiva, he, can, he, got, he was learning after he got married. What, what could we ask for more? As proud as parents can be. A couple of years later, he got married to a wonderful girl. We owe it to BGX. They, they made his life, and this was the place he came back to. He wasn't born here. He didn't go to high, much school or high school, but this is the place he came back to because this was it for him. I have a question, please, and um, talking about pleasures and instant gratification. This is a real question. A 13-year-old girl would like, it's her rite of passage, it's a year past Bas Mitzvah, she wants an iPhone. Mom and Dad do not, they're not comfortable giving her an iPhone. And the girl says to her mother, says, you know, are you from the 1900s? All my friends have an iPhone, why should I suffer? What would you advise the parents? I can't tell you if they should or they shouldn't get it. I, I, I would definitely be extremely fearful about giving an iPhone to a 13 year old. And that is with all the parental control settings that you can, that that you can, that you can have. Them. They know how to get around it. And also when we talk about a, a Siddisha girl, a Beisakov girl, a Manor, you know, what, what culture are they coming from? This, this, qu this question was presented by a mainstream average yeshiva family, a regular girl, Beisakov girl here in Flatbush. The daughter is desperate for an iPhone. They don't know what to tell the daughter. They don't want World, World War III, you know. I want to use this opportunity. You know, I, I man the phones all day, as you do. We have a magaifa going on with, this, with these phones. It's a magaifa. I could say now publicly for the first time there are, there are school, I have to be careful how I say this, there are numerous are schools that are having me come in and talk to the students, the high school students, about you know um, inappropriate relationships that are taking place, and this, this has never been done before. That in Beis Yaakov's or yeshivas, you have an outsider come in and talk about this. Why? It's all this, uh, the cell phones. Everything's immediately. I'll meet you here or this that, you know. Uh, we, we have to figure out what we're going to, you know, we have a real, real uh, magaifa going on. I mean, I have hundreds of stories in the last few years of Beis Yaakov girls, yeshiva boys, terrible problems with these cell phones, and their parents are giving them, letting them have iPhones without filters. Now, filters isn't always, they could get around it in a second, but there's different types of filters. Look, with the internet. You know, we're not going to win this war, but I always say publicly, that, that, you know, at least our goal is to minimize the amount of damage, minimize as much as possible. You have internet in your house, number one. It must be or laptops or computers, public place. Any parent who allows their son or daughter, starting at age 10, to have access to an unfiltered internet in their room and they could close the door, I don't know, they should be put in jail. I mean, it's just, it's just mind-boggling. And there are parents who are doing this. It has to be the public place. Number two, yeah, there, are, there are better filters, and then there's, there's many other ways that now is not the time where you can pr pretty much ensure that they get, can't get past it. And number three, the only person who has the password to the computer is the Rebbitson. 
at night, all computers are shut down. And, and if my son is in Chaim Berlin learning, and one day, you know, in 11th grade, the, the Rebbe doesn't show up because there's a Levaya, and they come home at 11 o'clock, and we're all out of the house, and they want to get onto the computer, you've got to call up mommy and get the uh, password, and she's not giving it to you. And this way, we, we have to minimize, but there's a Magefa going on. I'm, I'm, publicly, I don't want to talk about it. Magefa. Magefa. And Unzera homes everywhere, all types, Hasidish, Litvish, right wing, left wing, you, you name it. And we, we, we really have to deal with this. This is not the time and place for this, but that's but, how I see it. But the statement of Ein Bayus Hasha Ein Shameis is, is, tragically, is tragically true. And recognize some of the things that are going on. The phones have two both very, very dangerous, potentially dangerous things they could do. One is that they have the range of whatever there is on the internet of which a very, very huge percentage is not appropriate. Secondly, and not that there aren't wonderful things of this, Sfarim online, there's, there's Sfarim libraries online that you can get. I use them, I use them frequently, but, but there's, there's, there's a humongous amount of garbage. Profoundly destructive. The second thing that there is, and, and this is more on phones than it is on computers, although computers does have its side to it, is that we have pseudo relationships. A digital social relationship is not a true social relationship, but it is every bit as drawing and as tempting as a true social relationship w would be. And it's a very, very small step to go from the texting and the WhatsApping and the Instagramming and all that and moving from the social media into the actual, in, into the actual physical contact. And it's sad that this happens. And it's not only children, it's adults. And when we show our kids that we can have, I can have Instagram, I can have social media, and are we modeling for them that it's okay to do this when for them it's, it's a terrible threat? A piece of chocolate could be a very enjoyable thing to have if it's okay with your, your diet. If you give that piece of chocolate to a dog, you're gonna be picking up the carcass at some point because the dog cannot digest it and it's gonna die because of that. A child cannot have those kinds of experiences for the same way that a dog can't have a piece of chocolate. It can be very nice, it can be very useful. And we all use the, the digital communications but it can be so damaging and, so, and, and, and it makes kids feel as if they have a boyfriend or a girlfriend when there's no real relationship going on and then their guard is down and then when things progress from there to somewhere else, there's still no true relationship and we have somebody who's in a really, really, uh, is in really hot water. Right, thank you, Robert Grossberg. Yeah, I mean, not, not that the uh, people here need my haskam, but I agree with obviously with everything that they said. I'll just say that there is sometimes where it's nuanced. I, I've dealt with situations where the answer is no, so they go find a boyfriend who will buy it for them. Mm -hmm. And then it's an un, now there's a boyfriend who they owe something to, and it's an unfiltered, unknown phone. If I had a dollar for every time someone came into my office and the parents swore up and down the child does not have a, uh, an, a, an iPhone, and then I would call in and say, oh, we know about your iPhone. The jig is up. We know about it. Please take it out of your pocket and put it on my desk. The kid looks around nervously, and he takes out the iPhone, and the parents faint and, because they said no, so he just went ahead and got it himself. So obviously, again, the answer is definitely no. The answer you know, is definitely all of that. However, there are times where it's nuanced, where we have to look at the specific situation and understand perhaps getting them something filtered is better than them doing it on their own. Um, you know, these are times where you need shy. It's, there's no simple answer. You need, it's a shyless chacham that you need to have, and that's why I really believe that everyone going through an assignment like that needs a rav, but it's, um, it's not simple, and it is difficult sometimes when everyone does, and you know, sometimes you do research and you find that everyone does have one. It doesn't mean that just because everyone's, you know, if everyone would be jumping off the roof, would you jump off the roof? How many times do we hear that from our rebbein? But um, it's, it's, it's a nuanced you know, answer in terms of sometimes looking to do the least amount of damage um, while at the same time, you know, remaining true to what we believe in. It's, it's very hard to fight City Hall. If you send your child to a school that's not compatible with your hashkafa, and the kid is exposed to these devices, it's almost inevitable that the kid's going to get a device. 
Um, so, uh, you know, you have to, they have to always have negotiables and non-negotiables. And what are your non-negotiables? Uh, if you have non-negotiables that your family prides themselves that they stick to certain values, then you don't negotiate. But I uh, just want to maybe give a little word of chizuk to those that are entrapped, and so many are. The, I think they say from the Arizal that the last door, the last generation before Mashiach will be tremendous plethora of lust and temptation. And it will be the little puny us who are generations removed from Har Sinai that if we stand strong and don't succumb to the temptation, we'll be the ones to herald the Mashiach. So, you know, I think that, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth more than a pound of cure. We have to attribute that to Linus Pauling. Prevention, you know, talk to the kids and say, listen, there's a horrible, horrible Yetzirah out there that's got tentacles and that's trying to ensnare you. And you have hormones. I think it's important to talk to kids about, especially post-puberty, that they have hormones and what the hormones could try to drive them to do and what they may be subjected to. But nevertheless, we're very proud of you and that hopefully you'll stay strong. But if you have any issues, come to us, your parents, and we will be your confidants. You know, how many kids have come to, I'm sure you have the same experience. How many kids have come to me and have confided the most hair-raising, and I say to them, why don't you talk to your parents about this? They say, my parents, you know, you think, oh, I want to live. I don't want them to, you know, they'll kill me. I had a child in my office uh, who the parents said, why don't you tell us? So well, every time I tell you something, you scream at me. So they said, well, you're right. Yeah, I guess so. Like, that's why he's not telling you. If you're going to scream at him, you, you, know, you can't expect him to be open if every time he's attacked that he's open. I think that, that a parent must be the child's number one confidant. A child has to feel comfortable that my parent is not going to judge me. They may come up with a revelation that the parent may need to go to mikvah three times afterwards. But who cares? That's your child. That's your life. Your child has to feel comfortable having a dyad, having a dialogue, communicating to you the child's needs. And it, unfortunately, it's not commonplace enough. It's not prevalent. And if they won't have the parent, they'll have someone else. Exactly, exactly. So here's a question we received. How should this parent react? This, uh, the mother or father found their 15-year-old child smoking cigarettes or marijuana, and the, and the parents wanted to disown their child. They were so irate, so upset. What would you recommend? What's the appropriate response? How should the parents react when they catch their children, either 15-year-old with cigarettes or marijuana? How about some multiple choice here? <laughs> well, I mean, multiple choice. <laughs> A is you could you hit the child, chas v'shalom. You could scream at the child. You could threaten the child with some type of punitive uh, punishment. Or you could pretend you didn't see it. I don't think any of those are, are, are the options. First of all, chinuch is, when we say chanuch al pidarkoi, the question is, whatever kind of chinuch I'm, I'm going to be involved in, it has to be according to the needs of the child, not my needs. My needs may be to disown the kid, my need may be to yell at him and scream at him and take out my, take out my rage, whatever. That's not what the child needs. The child needs guidance. The child needs to learn to not engage in certain behaviors. You're not teaching the child how to live. You're basically getting rid of your own anger. That's not true chinuch. That's bad midas. And, and uh, it's, a, it's perhaps a, a, a rash statement to say, but yes, it's bad midas. Because you're not accomplishing what, what you need to, and this is the same for a mechanic as it is for a, a parent. And what does the child need? The child needs to be guided away from this. Now, I would examine this from a couple of, in, from, from a couple of angles. The popular angle is take the kid to a hospital where there's people on respirators and all of that because they've destroyed their okay. lungs. <laughs> so Today they can see these people walking through the street coughing. They don't have to go to hospitals for that. And I, 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 you know, we can, we can do that mechanic, easily. What would you suggest as a, something practical to... Well, well, well that's, one, uh, that's, that's definitely one way to do it. But the reason that that doesn't work is, well, you know, that'll happen yeah. after 60 years. No. I got the, you know, until 60 years I can do whatever I, I feel like. Which we can talk about how, how consequential thinking is is, is, is dormant at this point, and we have to talk about something that's very, very different. My focus would be, why are you smoking? 
Right. Talk to them. Sit down. What's, what's going what on? What is it? There's no pleasure from smoking because the first cigarette, you cough, you, you, cough, you get dizzy, you, you, you can get sick to your stomach. There's no inherent pleasure from a cigarette. What we're doing, what the people that experience pleasure from smoking are actually experiencing a reduction in the withdrawal symptoms. And they begin to, they associate that with the, with the taste of the cigarette, and therefore, they like it. It's not true pleasure. It's fake pleasure. Um, but I want them to know, why, why are you doing it? And you'll discover it's for totally different reasons. It's for social stuff, belonging, the image, I can show you what I can do. I'm, you know, I'm a big guy, look what I can It has much more to do with that. It's not pleasure to seeking. It's not pleasure. Rabbi Grossberg, what would you suggest to the mom and dad, mommy and tati that's calling really along the, the same lines. I mean, it's just in terms of uh, discussion. I hear from the kids themselves when they're punished. Basically, the message is hide it better. Hmm. That's the message. You know, if you tell them if they're in trouble, if they're punished, etc. You can talk to them. And believe it or not, by not telling them what to do, but giving them the information, guiding, discussing, et cetera, you have a much better chance of getting them to stop than almost challenging them to the point where they see the challenge and may decide dafka to go ahead and keep doing it. Right. So it's very interesting because at BGX, we counsel parents never to act viscerally, emotionally, or impulsively. You see something, don't have a knee-jerk reaction, call your Rav, call your Murad Derek, whatever it is, discuss it, but don't act based on emotion because it will be devastating. And what happens usually then is it even escalates further and further and further. You alienate and ostracize the kid, and you've lost that connection. Some years ago, this predates the Asif at the city field. I met up with Rabbi Rabbi Mishur Heschel Bick at a Simcha, and we were talking, and he says, you know, they're making this big thing in city fields about six to seven months before. What do you think about it? I said, look, the G'dayla Yisrael are backing it up, so I'm going to comply. Uh, I understand what the dangers are. I obviously, I, you know, I, I, I encounter that in my, in my work on a daily basis. So I'm not disagreeing with their hashkaf about it. I am questioning as to whether or not this is the, this is the means of how we're going to turn, uh, turn the claw around and accomplish something. And then the discussion went into, okay, we're watching our, our adolescents going through various stages of conflict. And he related to me the following experience. A, one of the, a, he was a manal, a skan manal in a yeshiva for a period of time. And a rebbe who happened to have been a chesidosh rebbe came over to him and he said, I just caught one of my bachrim, a 14-year-old who was Nichshel in the Chet HaYadua. He says, I, I, I think we should throw this Bukhar out of Yeshiva. And Rav Bik says, you know what? Send the Bukhar unto me. And he sits down with the Bukhar and he says, listen, you're a young boy, you have hormones. Almost everybody in the world has, has indulged at some point. He says, as a matter of fact, it's the exception who did not. Recognize this, understand that while the Torah doesn't talk about it openly, the Zaya talks about just how serious it is. And he gives him a bit of a, a background in that. And he says, look, you have this Yetzirah, like it, to some degree everybody does, and we have to deal with it. And to the degree that we deal with it, we grow in Kedusha. And he says, now here's what I want you to do. When you leave here, you're going to go to mikveh, and then you're going to go, go back to your regular yeshiva seder. And I want you to be makamal on yourself every day to do something which is an increase in the activities of kedusha that you do. If it's davening longer, if it's saying extra tilim, if it's learning for an extra five minutes, ten minutes, an hour, whatever it is. And then when he... <laughs> When he, he leaves, the Rebbe comes in and says, do you agree we should throw him out? He says, absolutely no. He says, I would throw you out sooner than him. No. <laughs> he says, why? What did I do? He says, this Bukhar, the worst that he did was that he engaged in Tumah. And on Tumah, the Pusik says, Hashaychenitam b'saych Tumaysam, it's a Pusik by Yom Kippur, by the Avaidah from Yom Kippur. Hashaychenitam b'saych Tumaysam. 
His involvement in Tuma in no way drives out the Shechina. He says, you're approaching this in, in, with a derech of Gaiva. He says, and Gaiva, the Chazal tell us, Hashem, the Shechina cannot coexist we're in the presence of a, of a Baal Gaiva. He says, I'd throw you out sooner than him. Our kids are getting into Tuma. It's a serious tumor and it's addictive and it has a, the tentacles and the grip on them is serious. Here's what the problem is. How do you get them back? How do you pull them out of it? And our tendency is let's, let's get rid of the cell phone. Let's stop this and stop that. And as much as the sur meira makes sense, but it doesn't attract them because when they're going to go away from that, they're going to be empty, they're going to be frustrated, and they're going to turn around and go right back to it even though they've already walked out of it. What do we do to make them feel comfortable here where we are, where we're hopefully living lives of, of Kedusha, we're, we're, we're connected to, to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. How can we help bring them into that and make them feel wanted here, make them want to be here? That, which is, we've, we've all said this several different times. The passion for involvement in Torah and mitzvahs being on the derech. What does on the derech mean? And truly it should mean, I am emotionally involved. We say, v'sein bili beinu bino. Love and haskel about divrei samud Torah sacha. Wait a second, isn't limud Torah an intellectual pursuit? What are you talking about lay? We should talk about mayach. No, 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 no. We have to be emotionally connected. V'sein Billy Bainu Bina. Our tefillah is that we should we should we should we should take in the divrei the divrei Torah in a way that we're emotionally connected with it. That's what we're looking for. And when the kids fall out, they're groping and looking and seeking for something that they're not finding here. Our task is to to make them feel wanted. The Rambam. It's, 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 it's an awesome line, it's a one line of the Rambam, that these kinds of taivas are found belave ponui min ha The people struggling with this are their heart, their, 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 their emotional capacity is ponui min ha it's devoid of chachma. The chachma has to have its its, its root, its location, it has to be founded in the person's emotional life. That's what makes the difference. Do any of the panelists have something to add before we go to the next question? So we'll jump into the next question, please. Rabbi Mechanic, you mentioned about uh, disciplining and, and the importance of not disciplining, but actually shepherding and guiding our children. So is hitting ever appropriate, and if so, when? Rabbi Grossberg. So, I mean, my, my Rebbe Revol was very against it. He felt that it's, it's almost lift naiver to, uh, to hit a child. Yeah, at any age. Yeah, at any, at any the classical lift naiver of hitting a child is, let's say, a teenager or... I mean, right, no, but, 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 the, but the point is that now, at younger ages already, they're aware that this is a, a violent act, and you know, we can sit and debate why the, the world has changed, but the world has changed. I mean, we were, we were hit maybe in yeshiva, etc., and things were different. But... Um, you know, see, rare, rare occasions for a small child that perhaps needed to understand the danger of something that needed not a hit to, uh, to hit, but just to, to make a point that this was something very dangerous, running in a street, playing with fire, something along those lines. But other than that, it's, um, you, know, you have to look always at everything you do in a cost-benefit analysis. What, you know, what's it going to cost you? What are you getting from it? Right? You, you might gain in your mind that you, you were mechanic your child, but what are you losing? What are you losing? Is there any benefit? And ultimately, the loss sometimes is much greater than the, uh, any possible gain that you may believe you're getting. It's very sad. I've met men in their 60s and 70s that are no longer from, and they told me that the only memory they have of Cheder is the Rebbe potching them. Punitive corporal punishment, I don't think it works. And the studies now show that n neurologically, it's, it's, it's detrimental. It's it detrimental. It, come, it comes back to haunt, and, and it causes a child to develop violence. What would you suggest, so dealing with a severely at-risk teenager, would you pick discipline or unconditional love? In other words, the child is taking over the oh house. Boy. The child <laughs> is he's ruining the entire, his complete dysfunction. I, I mean, I, of course, I'll you know defer to my esteemed colleagues, but um, the, the sheet that we've developed at BGX is that 
in order for a child to be able to thrive emotionally, psychologically, and physically, every human being needs structure and parameters. And there's no such thing as promiscuous or unbridled love. Because chesed could be zima also. Kindness, which is unbridled, could turn into something licentious. And a child needs to know that there are boundaries. So even in a case, now if a kid went through, underwent severe trauma, like sexual abuse, then it's a different, it's a different animal. It's a different ball game, yeah. Uh, but but there are claw. Uh, that, that is our shita, that is our opinion, that there, there's never a time, except for those few exceptions, that uh, boundaries would be, um, you know, would, would, would be relegated to the, to the trash bin. So uh. essentially, unconditional love has its parameters. R- Rabbi? All right, so this is a, I mean, it's a common question, as everyone's been saying, it really does depend on the situation. But I've always preached unconditional acceptance, acceptance without approval. It's not unconditional approval, because I speak to the children, and they tell me that when their parents are giving them a hug and kiss for doing something that's so wrong, that's so you know, inappropriate, they don't see that as approval. They see that their parents have lost their mind. Mm. Now, they, they, they know what's, what's acceptable and what's not, and therefore, you know, they, and not only that, they sometimes see it as their parents giving up on them. If my parent is um, hugging me and kissing me for being Mahal Shabbos, what they're saying is there's no hope for me. They're, they've accepted the fact that this is who I am and I'm never going to change. Does it have its place? It might. You know, again, it's a Shaila for a Rav, it, it, whether it does. But, but not to mix that up, the unconditional acceptance, though, is that you're always accepted in this house. The studies have shown a child has never returned to a locked door. You know, if you want them, there always has to be a place for them to return to or they're just not going to return. So I can accept you and unconditionally accept you. It doesn't mean that I have to approve of everything that you're doing. And I think the child, there's a certain sense of respect that each, both the child and parent build for each other with that mahalach and understanding that you can accept me. And, and not only that, but if you are approving of something that I know you don't approve of, you're confusing me. So it doesn't yeah, always work. Right, that's beautiful. You know, there's no divorce court when it comes to parents and children. There's for spouses. Uh, your parent never could divorce a child, and the child has to know that. Rabbi Mechanic? I, have nothing, I totally agree with what, uh, what Rabbi Sroll is saying. That's, 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 uh, they ha- and what you're saying, there has to be certain boundaries, um, except for the unusual, unusual situations. And uh, like you said, you could tell, you know, unconditional love and acceptance, but not approval for everything. Okay. Rabbi Dr. Torsky? I'm, I'm very much a, a, um, an advocate of unconditional love. Unconditional love does not mean no boundaries. In other words, you could be, you could be doing the worst things. It doesn't mean that I don't love you. It, it, it means that we have to make a distinction between the individual and the individual's behavior. I can hate what you do, and I can continue to, to uh, love you. It means that like to the hate, the, hate the sin, but not the sinner? Correct. And, and, it's, and it's, not easy, it's not easy because many people see it as splitting a hair. And um, it's true, it is splitting a hair, but it's an important split that has to be made because we have to be Yitamu Chatoim. Um, if we reject the, the children, A is we're basically feeding the same dynamic that caused them to step out of bounds in the first place. And the second thing is that so many of them, as whatever it is that they are doing, many of them turn around and come back it, all the way, part way. If we shut the door on them, as, as, as our professor was saying before, if, we, if they come back to a locked door, they're turning right around and going back out. And they're going to they're gonna find welcoming arms over there. They're going to be embraced by the street. They're going to be embraced by whatever the culture is that they've, that they've, that they've, uh, that they've tasted. That's where they're going to be. And it's a frightening place because we're looking for them to come back. Then why are we shutting them out? I'm just wondering, Rabbi Grossberg, would you say that it's better or worse 20 years ago that we have so many kids at risk, so many teenagers off the derech? So, you know, it's, it's tough in terms of statistics, but we have a much greater community. Um, the Eitzahara is a much greater now. Uh, I think also, though, we see it more. The, from what I understand, that in the old days, people that went off just disappeared. They weren't as noticeable within the community. 
But uh, there's definitely more pulling kids off now than I believe there was in the past. There's just uh, there's more opportunities for them to go. I, I was speaking to the Rashi Rav Shmuel Kamenetsky, um, and I had mentioned a number of years ago, and I mentioned to him, you know, in today's day and age, no one goes off the derech normally. In my days, you went off the derech normally. You didn't want to be from for whatever reason. You went to medical school, you went to law school, you got married. Today, it's 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 destructive. I would say number, it's just so destructive. They're destroying their bodies and souls. I would say the difference between now, uh, if you all agree with me, I don't know, the difference between now and 30, 40 years ago is number one, the ages are younger. That's number one. Sure. Number two, the, the, what's the word I could use? The, the sordidness, the... the the, the, the what? Shvelos. Yeah, it, it's just so sordid what's going on out there. You know, what was the worst thing that happened when we were growing up? Uh, I don't want to even say, what do we do? We drank a beer on Purim, you know, we smoked a cigarette, you know? And today it's just, it's, it's gefährlich what's going on. This was, the, this was the famous speech by you know, Senator Patrick Moynihan yeah, defining about defining way. deviancy downward. Yeah. In the 1960s, people were, you take pictures, you can look at pictures of people sitting in baseball stadiums watching yeah. a game, and the men were wearing suits and ties and hats, yeah. you know? Today, it's, just, it's like it, it takes casual to a to I remember I used to go to the Met level. games, Yankee games in the, in the 60s, the 70s. And then I didn't go for like 25 years until I had children. I remember the first time I, I went to a game in 25 years, I was horrified the way the people talked and the way they acted and the, and the cursing. And the, this, this is a different world, and our kids are exposed to this. So it's a younger age. It's much, much more destructive. And, um, and, accessibility and, and accessibility, oh my gosh, uh, <laughs> with the phones. It bothers me very, very much. It's very destructive when people say, you hear this all the time, eh, we had it in our days too. Give me a break. That is such a destructive statement. You're undermining everything we're trying to do to be mechane chador today with what with, 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 with we're up against. With one line like that, yeah, it was bad in our days too. Give me a break. Not in what they were doing, not in the percentages, not in the ages. So I, I went to a medical office. They asked me what gender I identify as. <laughs> I said, excuse me, don't you see a... B uh, imagine, this is permissiveness that I mean, our generations have not seen before. And our kids are all exposed to this. I could have never imagined this. Yeah. Right. And this is nothing. You know what's going to be 20 years from now, 30 years from now? So I'd like to please ask our very prestigious panelists, first of all, I'm super, super grateful that you made time to come today. We're talking about the destruction, and some of us are at a loss to explain what's taking place today in families. Our goal is to rebuild the base of Migdash and to see the Third Temple, to see Mashiach. If you could please share with us some closing remarks, just a thought, so Bezos Hashem, Tisha B'Av should become a Yom Tov. What would you suggest? So I would beg parents that their role is not to be authoritarians, disciplinarians, or policemen. Their role is to be horim. The etymology, the shorish of horim, parents is from the word har, mountain. Parents should be mountains. A mountain means that a parent understands that it's hard to climb a mountain. But our goal is for you to be able to reach the pinnacle. And we're here in every way to facilitate that, to coach you, to guide you lovingly, and uh, in any way possible, we're here for you because you are our hours forever. Thank you, Rabbi Rosberg. Tishbav is the Zman that we, we talk a mourn and is, that we're supposed to mourn. Um, but we also have a Shabbos Nachmu. We also have, you know, after we, we have our Zman of uh, mourning, we also have our Zman of Nechama, of, of uh, feeling a little bit better and, and having a little bit of. Uh, so, but I, I think that we've discussed, and believe me, nothing here has been in any way made uh, to seem worse than it was. It's exactly how it is, maybe even worse. It's a, you know, this was done for polite company. <laughs> but at the same time, we can't lose sight of the fact that as difficult as things are, Baruch Hashem, there's a lot of good things in our community to look at. We, you know, if we only focus on, we can walk out of here and just be very depressed, and we should be depressed, but at the same time, realize that Baruch Hashem, there's so much, we can have another hour-long discussion about the beautiful things that are going on, even in Chinuch, and that children are growing, etc. That doesn't mean for a moment we should be Messiah Das, we should forget all the negative things that are there that need tikkun, that need to be fixed, but at the same time, you know, to see that there is that other side as well. 
If we as parents and as mechanchim, if we are able to give over to our children the three amudei achinach that I mentioned, that we, they real, our kids have to know that we have a Torah emes. It's true. And therefore, even if your parents got divorced, and even if you had trauma in your life, two plus two still equals four. And therefore, the Torah is emes. Hashem gave us a beautiful Torah. And number two, we have a Torah schayim. That this is the most, if you study it and you, you hang around the people who really love Yiddishkeit, you'll see this is the best way of life. And number three, we're part of the Amhan Nifchar. And then we do a lot, if we could give that over to our kids, and we do a lot of davening and chosavas, and our kids understand, Ashreinu Matayv Chalkeinu, Ashabach Abon, we call Amim, Merit Hashem, they'll all remain on the Derech HaYoshar and bring us and Klai Yisrael Nachas. You know, the Tisha of context, we are crying over a Beis Hamikdash that was destroyed just shy of 2,000 years ago. And then, of course, the one before that, an extra, an extra 490 years. It is that deep of a loss that we continue the Avelos on it till today. Obviously, we are supposed to be experiencing this as feeling a tragic loss. Were we ever connected to it? I, I was born, you know, some like 1900 and some years after the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash. Uh, I, I, I never saw it. I never felt it. Uh, I was never inside it. I never uh, experienced it in my in my physical lifetime. How can I truly mourn it? And the answer to that is that we are as 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 an Am Kaddish, we are connected to everything that stands for Kedusha. We're connected to Taito, we're connected to the Rabbani Shalom, we're connected to Mitzvahs, and we're connected to the Beis HaMikdash. And we have today a bond with that Beis HaMikdash in its destruction. And we're crying over that, over the destruction part that we feel. Now, to, to put this into the context of the subject matter we've been discussing, um, the the, the child that comes to us with, where there's a problem, everything that they're saying, they could be complaining about this one and yelling at that one and, and asking questions about this. There, there's one message that they're always saying. It's like, you know, the, the Pusik on the top, but there's the little Isis of Rashi on the bottom. What's the real message? The message that the children are saying is, my soul hurts. And if we hear that, and we recognize that's our Avelis on Tisha B'av, is yes, it's the Beis HaMikdash that was destroyed, but I didn't see it. But the part of that Beis HaMikdash that has a connection to my neshama, that's what I feel. And I am saying in Tisha B'av, my neshama hurts. And we have to be able to recognize this with our children also, because this is what they're saying. And they're describing to us their Chobim Beis HaMikdash. And we have to somehow be menachem, and this is the this is the nachem nachu that the nachama comes be kiflayim, that we have to be able to extend to them. First of all, we're together in this. Hakadosh Baruch Hu is also in this in this with us, and by us extending ourselves to them, and then saying, okay, what can we fix? What can we be misakin? You know, some people say, "Oh, well, let, let, let's let's start uh, let's start dragging sheep into the Makkah Mikdash and let's start shechting them." That's not the answer. Hakadosh Baruch is building that base Mikdash, and our mitzvahs are, are are comprising the 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 brick and mortar of it. But what we have to do is we have to bring ourselves back, recognize that when the neshama hurts, the neshama needs to heal. How can we reach the child at the neshama level? Because it's not the hand, it's not the foot. Thank you so much to our very esteemed panelists. Super grateful you made time today to shed light on this very difficult, challenging topic and providing guidance to all of us with your wisdom. If anyone has any questions, you can reach out to us at BJX and we can try our best to facilitate 646-397-1544. It's a free complimentary helpline and we have industry experts in the field of Kiruv for over 20 years of experience. And of course, we could also recommend Rabbi Dr. Torsky, Rabbi Mechanic, Rabbi Sroel Grossberg to do what they can 
to help you as well. And uh, we should all be to the Gula Shleim of Mehrav Yemenu. Amen. Amen.